Greetings, Father Mark signing on, continuing the series on the papacy in the modern world, moving into the reign of Pope 234, Gregory the 15th, who reigned from 1621 to 1623. Following the post-Trent pattern, the conclave of 1621 was looking for a career, well, not, uh, for a diplomatic pope <coughs> to follow the stern ascetic papacy of Paul V. So they chose a career diplomat, Alessandro Ludovici, L-U-D-O-V-I-S-I. -I. He accepted election on February 9th, 1621, reigned for two years and five months, taking the name, the papal name Gregory, and he was the 15th to take that name. Born in Bologna, Italy, which was part of the Papal State, on January 9th, 1554, Alessandro was the first pope to have been trained in a Jesuit seminary, the Roman College, the Collegio Romano, from uh, 1569 to 71, although he himself did not become a Jesuit. He completed his studies at the University of Bologna with a doctorate in law, 1575, whereupon he was ordained a priest and entered papal diplomatic service under Gregory the Thirteenth. Alessandro honored the memory of this pope by taking that name Gregory when he was elected. Alessandro proved to be a hard-working and effective diplomat. He served on papal missions to Poland, Naples, Savoy, and Spain being made a cardinal in recognition of his service on September 19, 1616. He was elected by a universal acclamation among the cardinals in their first meeting uh, when the conclave opened. <clears throat> Though he had been elected <clears throat> by unanimous verbal acclamation, uh, as Pope Gregory did not want that to become the norm for papal elections. Therefore, on November 15, 1621, he promulgated definitive guidelines for future conclaves to follow, which remained largely unchanged until the 20th century. He mandated that no deliberations or voting could begin until after the ceremony of enclosure was complete, uh, meaning and, and waiting until after the cardinals were locked in uh, to the Sistine chapel or wherever it was that the conclave met. He also decreed that voting must be done in secret on paper ballots. The uh, Thirty Years' War was still going on when he was elected, uh, and it continued uh, uh, during his reign. I mean, we're, you know, we're not going to follow all the battles, but uh, uh, there, there were some events that we can't ignore. February 1623, the elector, uh, the uh, uh, one of the one of the positions of elector, the Holy Roman Emperor, the elector Palatine, which was in Germany, was uh, transferred to Maximilian I of Bavaria, uh, because uh, the the defeat of the Protestant forces at the Battle of the White Mountain in 1620 enabled the Catholics to rearrange the Imperial Electoral College such that the Kingdom of Bohemia, which had one vote, was controlled by the Habsburg family. The elector, Palatine, Frederick, Friedrich V, was a Protestant, um, whom the Bohemian Calvinist had wanted to crown as king, but he was defeated at the Battle of the White Mountain and then ran away, abandoned Prague after the defeat. Consequently, he lost, not, he lost not only the the crown of Bohemia, but also his own title of elector. So this title, along with its vote in the Imperial College, went to the Duke of Bavaria, Maximilian I, as a reward for his loyalty in that stage of the war. You remember, he was the general who won the Battle of the White Mountain. So then. This meant that five of the seven imperial electorates were held by Catholics. The three ecclesiastical principalities 
of Mainz, Cologne, and Trier, added to now, during the war, the Kingdom of Bohemia and the Electorate Palatine. Gregory offered no particular doctrinal teaching, but he is famous in history for taking one initiative in the area of teaching, which still remains part of the church. He created the congregation for the propagation of the faith. In uh, Latin, the Propaganda Fide, January 6th, 1622. With the mindset of a diplomat, Gregory wanted an established mechanism for dealing with lands that had no Catholic hierarchy. Initially, this meant non-Catholic lands under the control of Islam, Protestants, or the Orthodox churches. The bitter experience of the disastrous appellant controversy in England, which we covered, that went from, extended from 1598 to 1610, demonstrated that some form of canonical regularity was needed. So Gregory created a new congregation of the papal curia. Curia is his, you know, his senior council, like a cabinet. Uh, made it a regular position, another department, essentially, of the papal cabinet. It would uh, be served uh, initially uh, by 13 cardinals, two prelates, an official secretary, and a canonical advisor. The mandate was to govern <coughs> and coordinate policy to spread the gospel in lands without a formal hierarchy. The template they formulated was in four was a four stage process. First, an apostolic prefect would be appointed with certain authority over a given territory. An apostolic prefect was ordained a priest, but not ordained a bishop. And uh, often, for practical reasons, he would be a member of a religious order. Since religious orders had their own governing structure and could draw resources from more established places, they were often assigned a particular territory and a member of their order made apostolic prefect reporting in that capacity to the propagation of the faith. Though, if that was the way it was done, then he would be actually, you know, supported by, by his order. So it wasn't just some, you know, some guy just sent to, to you know, wander around some territory. Second, uh, if we're under his leadership, the numbers of conversions justified a higher degree of organization, then an apostolic vicar would be appointed. Uh, so seminarians, remember your canon law, the, the Latin term vicarius, vicar, has a, a very specific meaning in canon law. Vicar is one who exercises authority in the name of another. And so in, in, in this case, the, the apostolic vicar would be ordained a bishop Canonically, though, he would be an auxiliary bishop of the Diocese of Rome. And the die, of course, the, the Bishop of Rome is the Pope. Um, and, and so he would be responsible, just as an auxiliary bishop, you know, you, some of your dioceses may have an auxiliary bishop like we do in New Orleans. Um, and that auxiliary bishop is ordained a bishop, uh, you know, has the fullness of holy orders, but in terms of ecclesiastical structure, uh, he he's responsible to the ordinary bishop, or in that case, archbishop of the diocese. Well, in the case of an apostolic vicar, even though maybe a thousand miles away, canonically, uh, his his orders, you know, his his uh, his his authority to function, he's functioning as if he were an auxiliary of the diocese of Rome. <clears throat> Often, for reasons just mentioned, uh, these also would be men of religious orders. Stages one and two could take place in any territory, even if the church were persecuted, uh, or in the missions, if it was necessary to convert, a, to circumvent a corrupt you know, government, a leadership. For this reason, apostolic prefects and apostolic vicars often had to operate in secret, 
through an underground network, as, ha as was the case with the English that we covered previously. Third, uh, the next stage, if, if it you know if if it worked, I mean if you know if stages one and two worked, the next stage would be the organization of a regular hierarchy, with a resident bishop uh, of a diocese. A diocese would be created and have a resident bishop, uh, uh, and and the, and then the bishop would have the authority to create parishes, and all the you know or, ordain recruit seminarians, ordain them priests, and you know have to create the full panoply of of a of a ordinary functioning diocese at this stage the hierarchy i mean that 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 diocese that new diocese that new bishop would still be under the authority of the propagation of the faith as it would be it's a it's a diocese but we can be considered a missionary diocese um and that for example that was the case of the united states until 1908 even though you know, there were, there were millions, literally millions, of, of Catholics because of immigration. In the 19th century, uh, it was still considered missionary territory. And then fourth, the final stage uh, in territorial organization would be a full, a full hierarchical organization capable of sustaining itself uh, and, and sustaining uh, uh, clergy, uh, ordaining secular clergy, having full parochial life, meaning parish life with resident priest, and then responsible directly to the Pope uh, through the ad limina visits every five years. The goal of this process was to plant the gospel in a given land and then cultivate the growth of a local church. Uh, this was intended to correct the baneful pattern that had been unfolding since the discovery of the New World which we cover earlier in this playlist, um, of the attempt of, of most of the, the powers, the European powers that engaged in colonialism, their attempt to create a replica of the mother European country in the mission lands. So from the perspective of the population in those lands, the, the faith was closely tied to, to, the, to the monarchy and to the government of the European country and therefore the church would be associated with all of the abuses that that the colonial government enacted, even if the church had nothing to do with it and couldn't stop it. But it all came at the same time from their perspective. So that so this this process was a was a way to try to correct that, try to extricate the church from its uh, from its association with with the uh, malignant aspects of European colonialism. As we saw the, uh, earlier in this playlist, uh, the popes of the early 1500s had been forced by circumstance to grant vast authority to these monarchs uh, of the colonial, Euro the European monarchies engaged in colonialism because there was simply no way at that point to get to the New World. That there was no way the pope could get people to the New World unless it was on ships of those colonial powers, uh, Spain and Portugal and later France. Uh, but by the time Gregory the Fifteenth created the propagation of the faith in 1622, the option existed for, uh, of paying for passage on other ships, you know, even the Dutch. Uh, and even though the Dutch were Protestants, they were, it was a merchant. The Netherlands only exi it existed as a merchant republic, so they weren't going to turn down money. Um, because of this, history witnessed the spectacle of apostolic prefects and apostolic vicars sometimes being smuggled into colonies controlled by Catholic sovereigns on ships owned by Protestants whom the church considered heretics. Now in practice this procedure was limited in effectiveness in areas like Latin America where the territory was under tight control by a royal colonial machine. But it did prove effective in missionary efforts in the Far East uh, and the United States, uh, which you know, which did not have that, uh, were not under the control of uh, in the same way. Uh, this uh, Pope, uh, uh, in terms of sanctification, he uh, canonized some of the saints of the Catholic renewal. Uh, you know, the post post Trent. Uh, saints. Uh, he, the, on, on March 12, 1622, 
He canonized the, the Carmelite, St. Teresa of Avila, the founder of the Jesuits, St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Oratorian, St. Philip Neri, and a, uh, one of the original Jesuits, not the founder, but one of the original Jesuits, St. Francis Xavier. Pope Gregory was in frail health at the time of his election, uh, so he, he, uh, he died on July 8, 1623, after a reign of two years and five months. He was followed by uh, the long reign, 21-year reign, of Pope Urban VIII, and it is to his, his reign that we will turn next. So for now, thank you for your attention. The session is adjourned.